Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 257, featuring the fourth and final installment of my interview with Mr. Fergus Urquhart of Obsidian. In this part of the interview, we talk about uh, Neverwinter Nights 2, uh, Knights of the Old Republic 2, a uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves game that was canceled, and much, much more. Uh, we also talk about how to say no uh, to somebody without making enemies, and <laughs> why people think Fergus is such a, a great person to work for. Anyway, we've got a lot to cover, so without further ado, here is Mr. Fergus Urquhart. What was it like working on KOTOR to Knights of the Old Republic 2 for those who... Well, I guess people probably yeah, yeah. don't want to see no, it. No, it was... I mean, it was... I just fun. think about those Star Wars fans I know. I it mean, was Star they Wars. were so obsessive about, like, all yes. this, this 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 lore and the universe yep. and all that. I mean, that must have just been a nightmare. The extended trip. universe and all that kind of stuff, yeah. Um, what well, was... So, it was... There was I think you get a PhD in Star Wars lore now. <laughs> it was... So, it was... It was... It was... Really, in the end, it was, um, you know, we our secret weapon is Chris Avalon. You know, Chris just went and read everything. And, I, and when I mean he read everything, he read everything. He read every source book, every novel, every Star Wars thing he could get his hands on. He read, and he was pretty much, <coughs> excuse me, more of an expert about Star Wars uh, than most of the people probably at Lucas. Probably than George Lucas. <laughs> I, I, it was possible, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so, but that was what was cool. And so Star Wars was just this... Um, and, and the other great thing, weirdly, from a business perspective, you know, of getting to work on a Star Wars game is that, you know, okay, so if I go to a banker, no banker knows, unless it's a very special banker knows the words Baldur's Gate or Icewind Dale or Planescape Torment, they all know Star Wars. And so the, the, the great thing about starting a business, um, and Ray and Greg actually told me this, that was the thing, is they were, because they called me up after Brian, uh, uh, Simon had talked to me about it. And, uh, and they said, well, you know, one of the good things is just from a standpoint of like a business standpoint, you know, business thing. And I was like, wow, I hadn't thought of it that way. But it was totally true. And so, so we kind of had that, and, and it, was, it, was, it was a fun project to work on. It was challenging, um, but it was just fun to get to play in the Star Wars universe. I understand at one point you were told that you were going to have all this extra time to mm -hmm. you know, get it finished, and then suddenly, I guess, uh, somebody went back on their word, or, or what happened? So, yeah, so what happened? Sorry, I'm you be this... Uh... <laughs> Yeah, if you need a so minute, take a little break. My, my PR guy is reminding me that I have um, an interview with you at three. So, um, so you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, but anyway, so, um, uh, so, so what happened? This is so what happened with Kotor two about time and things like that. Is there was a little? I think what we heard later. There's a little bit of like. At LucasArts, was a feeling they didn't even think we were ever, they didn't think we were going to come through. And so they really, they really, even though KOTOR 1 was a game of the year game, they just thought we were going to flub KOTOR 2. They were a new studio, like we weren't Ray and Greg, you know. Must have done wonders for morale around there. Well, we didn't know at the time that that's how they felt. Like we found this all this stuff out later. And so then, you know, so we'd been working on it for, you know, three or four months and come like early, this would have been early 2004, so like January 2004, our producer comes because we've been showing our stuff and they were like, everyone's like, this is awesome. They were like, wow, you've, you've, you've taken what KOTOR was and you really made it a true sequel and made it, you know, added to it and made it better and made cool things. And, and they're like, so we don't want to like, we were kind of sandbagging KOTOR too. Like, let's not sandbag it. Like, let, let's really blow it out. And let's, so let's, Let's not ship it, you know, in 2004. Let's ship it early 2005. Let's give it a three, you know, three or four more months. And, and we're like, that's awesome. We'd love to do that. And so we started planning that thing, started, edu you know, started moving on that. And this was my first big business lesson of like, you know, this was our producer from, because I was going off as Chris Parker would have been, well, Chris Parker was our producer at Interplay who dealt with Bioware. And if Chris Parker, or I knew if Chris Parker said something to Ray and Greg about this is how the business is going to work, like that meant that's what we're doing. You, you know what I mean? There's no like, I don't go back on what we, you know, as, even when I was a publisher, if I told Ray and Greg we were going to do something this way, then that's what it was. There was no like going back on it. You know, there was no take backs, you know? And so, um, and so it, so I just Undo didn't do with a contract. I did, it didn't occur to me. I mean, at the time, which was really stupid was to, uh, was to get an amendment to the contract right away. And so we didn't get an amendment to the contract right away. 
And, and then there was a big shakeup at um, LucasArts in the middle of 2004, right around E3. So we come off of E3 and we just get, we're in a phone call and we're just told you must now, you must ship it according to the dates in your current contract. We're like, well, what, but we've built another planet. You know, we've, we've worked some more on this stuff. Like we were expecting three more months. They said, well, that doesn't matter. You have to you deliver it to your contract or all the penalties and bad things that happen to your contract will happen. And, um, and I had no contract that said otherwise, no amendment. And so we worked our asses off to, to get it to ship when it, to get it shipped when we said it was going to ship and originally in the contract. And that meant, you know, dropping a planet and, and corn, you know, kind of, you know, taking maybe would have been a broader end game to kind of a narrower, shallower and not shallower, but sort of yeah, narrower end game. Um, yeah. And that's kind of, kind of how, how it all went down. Have some mom begin this confused with Neverwinter Nights too, but have some modders come back later and put some of that yes. content back in. So now you yes. can play it. You have play, you played yeah. those modded versions? I have not played the modded version yet. Um, so I actually, I actually just downloaded. I finally downloaded it again off Steam, um, the other like about a couple months ago. And I was meaning to play, and then something happened. I wanted to play something else. I think um, I finally wanted to finish Diablo three. Is I think part of it is I finally went through when the expansion came back. Pack for Diablo three came out. I went finally finished that. Um, uh, but, and among other things, but yeah, so no, I haven't, I haven't played that yet, but that's, it was called the restoration Kotor to restoration team or something like that. That's right, so a quick question here from John. Well, maybe, I don't know. Maybe it's a quick question. <laughs> <laughs> Jonas Penning DeVree asks, how did you envision the story after Kotor 2? How do we, like, uh, I guess what was going to happen after that? You know, we, oh, God, wow. 2014 this was i think we made our first first pitch for that at the end of 2014 so our 2004 so i've been 10 years ago i i bl bluntly i honestly don't remember and we've pitched a number of star wars games since then and so they kind of all smear in my mind some kotor games some not um but uh but yeah no i don't i don't remember that one i don't remember i don't remember what that story was okay here's another one uh this might seem kind of related. Well, it's not actually very related, but <laughs> it's kind of a oh, funny no. question. You know, the funny thing I can say. Um, interestingly enough, uh, so uh, I do remember, well, I'm not going to go into the story, but re more recently, Chris, just to have something down, did put more of a, like, story together for what would happen in Kotor 3. Um, I don't know if we'll ever get to make it, uh, but, you know, it's always been a hope of mine that we could go back to Kotor 3. And what about the Snow White game, uh, Dwarves? You know, so I yeah, I think the same thing happened with the, the shakeups with the CEOs, right? And yeah, that one is—it's kind of unclear what happened there. You know, I think at the end it was she had a whole heard, year of production on that before. Whole year production, and and and, it, and it's you know, I don't know where there were if and when. I, we've we've heard third hand that there weren't approvals. You know, on us actually being able to use Snow White. And it wasn't our idea. I, actually, Disney came to us with the idea. And so there was no approvals for that. And so then that was bad. And then and then there was a changeover in the CEO. And we just kind of caught, caught up in the whole, got caught up in the whole thing. And was it a good game? Uh, you know, it's, it's funny because there's people, I mean, people who obviously still here who worked on it. And, and, and there, it is a lot of them who have worked on other canceled games, at, you know, at other companies and, and some here. Um, it's the one that they all are the most disappointed about that it got canceled. Yeah, so it's, it's just real super cool concept art. The game was just working really well. Um, yeah, it would have been really good. It would have been cool. I could think of at least seven adjectives to describe it, right? <laughs> uh, so here's a question from, I guess this is Kisa Perch, or Perch. Mm -hmm. uh, why do you hate Star Trek so much? <laughs> So I don't hate, I actually don't hate Star Trek. That's, that's the funny thing is I really don't hate Star Trek. Um, I did work on Star Trek games. So I, I worked on a, on a, D, a game, not DS, I worked on a Game Boy Star Trek game that was really hard um, to play. So when I started work, I tested. So, um, and then, uh, well, I actually tested two, three Star Wars Trek games, four, God, I'm thinking. I might have tested four Star Trek games, which was a Game Boy game, uh, an eight-bit Nintendo game that was actually eventually published by Acclaim and not by Interplay, and then the two in, the two PC games that Interplay did, which was 25th anniversary and Judgment Rights. Um, 
so yeah, so I were I already I've done a lot of Star Trek. Um, and the only thing I would say is because I did turn down a Star Trek game at one time, which was, and this was before the reboot, and this would have been like 2000, I don't know, 2005, 2006, maybe somewhere in that area. Um, maybe a little bit later. No, yeah, maybe a little bit later, 2006, 2007. It just didn't seem relevant. Like, you know, there was no, Enterprise was off the air, Voyager had been off the air for a while, and, and both Enterprise, you know, Voyager was like, you know, kind of limped along to its last episode, and Enterprise didn't even make it to its last episode. And it was just one of these things of where, like, as a watcher of Star Trek, I like DS9, that's probably one of my favorite ones. Um, and Next Gen, then Next Gen, and, and, and that kind of thing. But, um, and I've seen all the movies. But um, it just didn't, it was like, if we're gonna choose to, to go play in a world, let's go play in a world where that, that people are interested in right now. And it was hard for me to know or tell how, what was the crossover with gamers and Star Trek at that point in time. All right, so Neverwinter Nights 2. Mm -hmm. Now this must have been a dream come true, right? The, to be back working on a AD&D. On D &D. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I love d, &D. I wish we were working on a D&D &D game right now. I love D&D. &D. Anything else you want to say about Never, <laughs> Never Winter Nights too? <laughs> sometimes you, it's just sometimes your 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 uh, the transmission clicks. Oh, I'm bit. sorry. Yes. No, so I thought maybe you were gonna. No, 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 no worries. I thought you missed this. Um, no, Never Winter Two. So no, it was great. I I um, it was a, you know, because you know I had a lot of the you know when I was it was you know a few of us that really kind of came up with the original Never Winter, and I always loved the idea of it being mod, you know, and that this is something we could go let people go make new ones, and and it was interesting because I think. I think we made some really good decisions. I think we made some bad decisions about like the one thing you can make much more robust, interesting, like unique modules with Neverwinter 2 compared to Neverwinter 1, but it's a lot harder. You know, like Neverwinter 1, it was just easy. It was more like Lego, more easy, more like Lego blocks than Neverwinter 2 editor. And so I think that that now that made us, we can make the, the main, the, the core of the campaign more unique. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I also look at Neverwinter 2 sometimes, and I, I wish as a developer we'd done a little bit better job of, of like, scoping and, and, and scheduling. You know, you talk, you, if you talk to me long enough about my games, I will tell you how they all suck. Because I, you know, I just am always about, I want it always to be better. I want it to always, us to make the thing better the next time. I want it to be, I want us to make awesome games for people. And so, so I often, it's not just how I'm focusing on the negative, I'm focusing on that is something we need to do better next time. And so that's often when I'm thinking back to my games, you know, what my memories are. They're either silly stories or they're, or they're things about how we need to do better. But no, a lot of Neverwinter in the end, I mean, I really enjoyed playing Neverwinter. I didn't get to finish it before it came out, but right after it came out, I, I, I you know, actually I didn't finish Neverwinter Nights 2. I came really close and then I got distracted by something else. Um... And, uh, but I still put, I don't know, hundred hours into it, you know, 120 hours into the game. Um, I, you know, so, and I, I, you know, I, I, you know, it's, it's just, I love are those RPGs. I, you know, I mean, that's in the end. So when you say like, it must've been a dream tr to come true to come back to them. It's just, that's what I, and a lot of the people here really love is just getting to make those games. And, and then on top of it being something where people could go mod all these things, um, and then we get to be just freaking rules nerds all the time about like, well, I think this, I think this. And then Josh comes in and goes, I want to put deities in, you know? And so, I mean, it's, you know, it's a bunch of 12 year olds with driver's licenses and houses getting to be, you know, getting to make games. It just blows. You know, I'm really impressed by the modding community on, on both of those games. Mm -hmm. That's pretty crazy. So in 2010, we get Fallout New Vegas, which mm -hmm. is a uh, widely re regarded, you know, including by me is uh, being better than... <laughs> You know, Bethesda's. Fair enough. I take that as you will. But uh, you know, I wonder what you folks thought about the engine and Bethesda's reimagining and how this, mm -hmm. how the new games compared to Fallout 1 and 2. Uh, do you think it filled those shoes of the original games? I don't know if I'm allowed an opinion. It, <laughs> I, I, sound, I was going to sound like a weird statement. Like, having been the lead designer in you know, Fallout 2, having worked with Tim and Chris Taylor, uh, Mike friend Chris Taylor, not Chris Taylor of Gas Power Games, um, and who was the lead designer on Fallout 1, uh, on like the special system, and of course working, I don't know how many hours, both on Fallout 1 and Fallout 2. Um, you know, 
sometimes like what I may say is my opinion valid, but I wouldn't mean, by, mean that it's like, I just like playing in a fallout world. I don't think fallout needs to be turn-based. I don't think I need to have some aspects of being an RPG. I don't, you can't make it a race game or a, I think at some point RTS loses its like what fallout is, or you'd have to be really careful. I mean, what fallout is, is it's a game. It's a world that is meant to be an RPG in which you play around and shoot mutants and, you know, kick kids and take drugs and, and all this, we- all this weird stuff, you know, you get to be the paladin and the anti-paladin at the same time if you want to be. And so that's what Fallout is to me. And, I, and that's absolutely what the team at Bethesda did when they created, um, when they created um, uh, Fallout 3, you know. And then, and then as for the engine, um, and I think, I think I, I have to give them a ton of credit also for doing the VAT system. I mean, that really helped kind of, I think, for, pe- for people that maybe just don't want to, are, are a little intimidated by like a first person shooting system it lets them play in this game and feel good about it you know and i, I think they, they whatever accolades they have gotten i mean whatever i mean it's almost like i would say that um whatever accolades they have gotten for for like elder scrolls and fallout i think they almost even you know deserve them more for um for fallout because they were what they were able to do uh, so no and, and from an engine perspective um you know it it's you know the engine does everything an RPG needs to do, you know? Is it a little long in the tooth? Totally, but RPGs are big, complicated things, you know? I mean, and a lot of people like, you know, a lot of people, well, some people think that they're, they're like, you should just be able to make them better than you do, you know? And other people like, I don't even know how you make them, they scare the crap out of me, you know? And so it's like this whole thing. And so I think like, you know, and the technology evolves as it as it goes. And, um, but all in all, if like you ask our level designers here, like the, the guys who put the levels in, um, they love, they love uh, the engine because it is it is made for level designers. Time for one more. More. Okay, so I saw you won this award, uh, the okay. unsung hero of the year. <laughs> oh, you remember that one? Oh yeah, 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 I forgot about that award. Yeah, and I, you know, reading all these other interviews and watching you, and I see everybody describes you as like this. Just incredibly nice guy. You know, a couple of them I read was, I can't believe a guy this nice is, you know, running a, <laughs> a game studio. Right, but there right, must right. be situations where you have to crack a whip or, uh, you know, tell people no, even though it's something they're real passionate about. Uh, right. You know, so how do you handle those kinds of negotiations without making enemies? I just fire them. No. Um. <laughs> right. No, no, so no. They're just, you're paying them to say these how nice of a guy. Yeah, no. What I, what I do... I am very much about explaining to people why, why I think the way they do or the, why, why I think the way that I do about things. So if someone comes in with an idea, I just try to explain it to them. I said, I, I think that's a good idea. I mean, it sounds stupid, but I, I think it's a good idea for this reason, this reason, this reason, and not for this reason, this reason, this reason. And then at some point I said, and unfortunately, like if we have 30 great, great uh, pitches or great ideas a year, like we can maybe do two of them, you know, and, and then, and then my job, you know, and this is maybe being the, I don't know, it's just the super pragmatist, but my job is to make sure we all have jobs next year. And so my job is to, is to kind of look at all these things, talk to the other owners, talk to everybody and kind of figure out like, what is like, what do I think is give us the best chance to be successful and continue to get, have jobs, which is continue to make gains. Um, and that's how I explain it. And then I try to explain all those things to people about why that is. I mean, I, I, there's, if there's one thing um, that I think you ask any employee of Obsidian or even back at Black Isle, and I think even more so at Obsidian, like they feel like they have information. Like they, they, if they want to know something, they come in my door and they ask me a question or, or they ask one of the other four owners of the company. Um, we explain things to people. So they may not like our answers. They may not like that we're saying no but they know that we thought about it. They know that we've considered it. And, and so in the end, I think probably the best way to explain it is it's saying no, but being respectful, you know, respecting that, like, I don't necessarily, I don't necessarily know better than anybody else, but I am, I'm fortunately or unfortunately I'm the guy who has to make the decision, you know, and that's just the reality of it, you know, and, and I'm sure sometimes they probably think I'm in here flipping coins, you know, <laughs> so, um, nice anyway. but, <laughs> But in the end, someone's got to make the decision, um, and I and I try to take everything into account. And I think they believe that, you know. I think they, I think they trust that that's what happens. And so, you know, then I I don't end up with enemies. And 
that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. You know, and I know that there's some games I didn't get, get to ask Fergus about. Uh, we, you know, we ran out of time. So all you guys that wanted to hear about Torn, uh, sorry. But on a, more, on a positive note, though, he has agreed to come back on the show later and uh, answer the rest of the questions. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, just because you didn't hear your question this time, uh, don't give up. Hopefully we'll have him back on soon and, and finish talking about all the uh, the games we didn't cover. I mean, there's, there's a lot of stuff that, you know, you could talk to that man for weeks or even months and not get, not get everything. Uh, as always, I want to thank you very, very, very much, guys, for supporting me and my uh, Matt Chat show. If you like these interviews and uh, reviews of classic games, uh, please uh, sign up for your own uh, Patreon supporter account. Uh, you can sign up for whatever amount you want. A dollar a month is fine. Uh, yeah, actually, that's 25 cents per episode. Or you can do a dollar per episode, five dollars, ten dollars, if you want to be uh, listed on the in the super supporters uh, rank on the credits. But anyway, there's lots of ways for you guys to, to help out with the show. I really appreciate it. I definitely couldn't do this alone, so thank you. Uh, news from the Matt Cave. Uh, very sad news uh, for me person on a sort of personal level. Uh, one of my favorite games or game designers is a Load Runner. Hang on, I got that backwards. One of my favorite games is Load Runner. You guys might remember. It was one of the very first games I covered on the show. It's a favorite uh, from my childhood. And I'm very sad to, to let you know that uh, Douglas Smith, uh, the creator of that game, has uh, passed away. He was uh, still relatively young, too, so it's just uh, very sad for everybody. Uh, the news was posted on his website. And it, you know, it really does go to, goes to show, though, I think, that you never know when these designers are going to to pass away and of course once they're dead you know there's the, there's no hope for any more interviews there's no chance to sit down with them and have a a mad chat with them what's really sad about this this one was you know he's one of those guys that I've had on my list forever to try to get in touch with and have him on the show so this was just kind of a you know a <laughs> very unpleasant uh, experience learning that so you know I hope uh, that uh, Douglas Smith his uh, legacy will live on I hope his family can you know, is, is doing as well as they, they can be under these uh, uh, circumstances. All right, a little bit more positive news. Uh, Michael Hartman, uh, his is a game that I, I've been telling you about this Kickstarter called Stash No Loot Left Behind. You know, I'm happy to say that did meet its goal. It was $50,000 goal. Uh, he actually went over that a little bit, so 52000 So congratulations to you, Michael, for that. You know, and by the way, I also had him on the Google Air Hangout, so another one of the perks of being in the Patreon club. Uh, so anyway, congrats to Michael and to everyone who's looking forward to this game. Uh, and then I guess back to a little slightly more negative news. Uh, we have the Fable Anniversary game released on Steam a couple, either yesterday or the day before, I think. It's only up there for $35, and I say it's kind of mixed news because the early reviews I've been reading, you know, I haven't played it myself yet, but the stuff that I've been reading about it suggests that it's really just kind of a badly done port of a, a 360 game. <laughs> uh, I guess it's on the Unreal Engine or something. But anyway, the, the problem with it is the mouse support is lacking. and uh, There's a few other issues with it. I mean, you can play, apparently you can play a mouse, you can use the mouse to play the game, but not, not, uh, not in the menus. So it's kind of weird sounding. And a lot of people are giving it the thumbs down, so kind of sad to see that. I was really hoping this would be good because I've, I haven't ever played the first one all the way through. And I was, you know, looking forward to playing the HD version of it. Uh, so kinda, I'm going to wait and see if maybe they fix some of this stuff in patches. You know, if you guys have played the game you don't think it's that big a deal, uh, let me know. I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. $35 is not really an impulse buy for me, so I like to read the reviews. Make sure it's uh, worth it. And on that note, uh, what about that ale of the week? Well, you guys know I got a thing about pumpkin ales. And I found this one, Alaskan Pumpkin Porter. It's got a little picture of the Alaska State Fair, a big pumpkin. And this was at the Minnesota State Fair, and I saw these huge pumpkins. And I was probably the, one of the few people there that were thinking ale. <laughs> at these big, you know, how much a pumpkin ale you can get out of one of these things. But... Anyway, it's ale brew with pumpkin, obviously, and also a brown sugar and spices. 7% uh, alcohol by volume, so, uh, you know, it's on up there. It's uh, brewed and bottled in, oh, how do you pronounce that, Juneau, Alaska, alaskanbeer.com. So anyway, I really like the bottle here. And I'm kind of curious what a pumpkin porter, I like porters too. 
So I'm really curious about this combination, how this is going to taste, and you know. Anyway, let's just, <laughs> you know, is it going to compare to a pumpkin? I've got my doubts. But anyway, let's get this one open and see what it's all about. All right, so I've got some of this pumpkin porter here in the rather excellent drinking horn. I've been smelling it. You can definitely smell those uh, pumpkin flavors, that pumpkin pie spice. I like aromas, quite nice. It's uh, not overpowering though. Uh, you can tell it's in there, but it doesn't seem to be that strong, at least in terms of the aroma. Anyway, let's give it a taste. <clears throat> kind of a, a strange taste. Uh, you don't taste the pumpkins at all, at least I don't. I taste more of a sort of bitter bitterness, uh, sort of a cherry chocolate-like uh, flavor. You know, it's almost like a, a porter, it's sort of just the, <laughs> somehow if you can make a porter smell like pumpkin uh, without making it taste like pumpkin, that seems to be what I've got going here. Let me try it again. Yeah, just a lot of sort of chocolate cherry, a little bit of a, uh, what is that, kind of a peanut butter-like uh, quality to it. You know, I wouldn't even know this had pumpkins in it if it didn't have the uh, that, that pumpkin smell. You definitely don't taste them. It's not it's not bad, but just you know, if I'm going for a specialty brew like a pumpkin, I really want it to smell and taste uh, like the pumpkin. So, not real impressed with this one. I mean, they got the smell down, but hey, guys, <laughs> where's the flavor? I guess I'll go uh, uh, two out of five drinking horns on this. It's pretty good for a porter, uh, just not really good for a pumpkin porter. You know, they need to get some more pumpkin. A flavor into this but anyway I think two out of five is, is pretty fair all right so well, let's wrap this up with a quotation and I was looking for quotations about bosses and I found a, a one I really liked uh, from Sam Walton you know the, the founder of a Walmart <laughs> you know I got who, who would have thought who would have thought he was so eloquent but anyway it's a really good quotation and it goes something like this there is only one boss the customer. And he can fire everybody from the chairman on down simply by spending his money somewhere else. See you guys next week. You can hold on to your red snapper. Oh, you can go for what's in the box that Hiro-san is bringing down the aisle right now. What's it gonna be? in the box!